All right, so what do we have to do today? All right, a few things. First of all, we were not completely done with chapter 16, our discussion about monopolies. Uh, one major topic that we haven't quite gotten to yet <clears throat> is our discussion about um, antitrust laws, which are the laws that prohibit the formation of monopolies. Oh. Good morning. Anyway, um, so I think I, uh, we had actually started to talk about price discrimination and I think we were pretty much done with it. So I believe all that we still had to do was the discussion about antitrust laws. And then we were not completely done with that chapter 16 problem set because it had a few problems down here, 21 through 25 <clears throat> or so. This last group needed the discussion from uh, our discussion about uh, antitrust laws in order to answer these questions. So, so basically we're wrapping up here. Oh, um, all right, here's what we're gonna do with that. So there is a second sample midterm that's been posted. And so my plan is for us to go over it on Thursday. And then when that's done, I'll post the uh, actual midterm and then you can have about a week to do it. So um, that should, I think that'll make sense. So yeah, no, absolutely. So you have plenty of time to work on the sample midterm and then plenty of time to do the actual midterm, which, is based on chapters seven and 14, okay? The perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, all of that will just be in the final exam. So the second midterm is just about seven, which is our discussion about government interference in the marketplace and production costs, all right? So, so on Thursday, we'll go over the second sample midterm and then I'll post the actual test. But in the meantime, we're going to do the following two things. We're gonna wrap up chapter 16. We're gonna wrap up that chapter 16 problem set, which is almost done, except for those few questions at the end that we weren't ready for. And then we can dive into 17, which is our discussion about monopolistic competition. Now, I think I mentioned once before that monopolistic competition is probably the most commonly seen type of market structure in the real world. And the name tells us exactly what we need to know about it. It is a combination of perfect competition and monopoly. Kind of interesting, it's a little bit of both. And so I believe we may also have one or two videos based on monopolistic competition. We'll see how that goes. Let me just go double check my list. Uh, where are we? Uh, videos, yes. Let's see if we've got, yeah, I'm pretty sure we do. Um, mm, there they are. Yeah, I've got two or three videos for perfect competition, I mean, sorry, monopolistic competition. So we may get to watch those today as well. But first, let's take a look at what was in um, chapter 16 about um, not, not the main theory of monopoly, but the antitrust legislation that's designed to prevent monopolies from forming. And we've already discussed this before that um, Standard Oil was broken up in the early 20th century. And since then, the government has had uh, the position that monopolies should be prevented from forming, except under very unusual circumstances where uh, the cost of production would be so low for monopolists that they allow it to happen. And they call that a perfect, uh, sorry, natural um, monopoly. But most of the time, the government opposes any mergers that appear to cause what could be considered a monopoly or something very close to it. So that this actually appears, this material, in an appendix. This is not in the chapter 16 slides. It's in the appendix. So I set, I posted that separately because this is really kind of a separate topic. But um, so if you look in the blackboard, you'll see that there is a chapter 16 appendix. This is what we're looking at right now. And so the title of this section is Measures of Market Power. Now, here's the real problem in the real world with defining these different types of market structures. It's hard to be sure if a firm is really a perfectly competitive firm. Um, it's hard to be sure if a monopolist is a true monopolist 
And so in other words, there have to be some standards or benchmarks that we can point to, to help us identify what type of market structure each firm is operating in. So the Justice Department, which is responsible for the antitrust laws, has created some indexes that can be used to help us determine how competitive a market is. All right, because it's usually not so open and shut as we've made it sound so far. In other words, we've been assuming that an industry is either perfectly competitive or else it is a monopoly. And we haven't really thought about how to determine what's going on with the intermediate cases where it may not be so obvious if it's a true perfectly competitive industry or a true monopolist. So we have these two indexes that we can point to. And as you can see, they're called the Learner Index and the Herfindahl Hirschman Index, which we will of course from now on call HHI. And so these two measures help us understand just how competitive a market really is. The uh, Justice Department looks at these numbers when they try to decide if they should allow a merger to take place or not. Because what they're trying to find out is what happens to the market or what's going on in the market now. And they want to compare it to what the competitive position would be if they allow the merger to take place. So how are these measures, uh, in, uh, how, how do we calculate these measures? Well, first of all, the learner index is very simple. And you can see it's nothing but the difference between the price at which we're selling the good and its marginal cost, all divided by the price. So it's essentially the percentage difference between the price at which we're selling the good and the marginal cost of producing it. Now, what we need to understand is what the numbers are actually telling us. Okay, so for this type of index, the range of possibilities um, starting at zero. So a perfectly competitive firm in this case would be uh, have a learner index of zero. Now, why is that? All right. So let's go back and revisit our graph of a, a perfect competition. All right, hold on one second. Let me just get a little drawing going here. So this is a perfectly competitive firm that is earning zero economic profits. They're selling Q star units of the good at a price of P star. But if you notice at this point, P equals MC. All right, so because the learner index is written as L equals P minus MC over P, if P equals MC, then it should be clear that L equals zero. So with a learner index, a, a score of zero would mean that we have a truly perfectly competitive firm in a perfectly competitive marketplace. Okay, so that's the benchmark for perfect competition. Then as we see the number increasing, now clearly if the demand curve is downward sloping like it is for a monopolist, um, we're going to have a very different outcome. So with a learner index, um, it can only go as high as one. All right, so one would represent a monopoly. Okay, so therefore, what we know from all this is that the learner index has a minimum value or ranges between is defined such that if L equals zero, this is perfect competition. If L equals one, this represents a monopoly. And clearly everything else is somewhere in between. Now, the only unfortunate thing here is that it doesn't really give us a lot of information about the intermediate cases. For example, where do we define 
monopolistic competition, for example. So you know what I'm gonna do just real fast? I bet we can find this on the internet. So yeah, so these guys are saying that they're not even trying to give us the, uh, the ranges. They're saying that this is useful. It is largely restricted to theoretical studies because of the difficulty of accurately measuring costs and practices. Other measures such as the HHI are more commonly used to gauge monopoly power using real industry data. All right, well, that's all we needed to see. I, okay, so I guess we're not gonna focus too much attention on this one. This is the big one, HHI, Herf, Herfindel Hirschman Index. So this one is a little easy, well, conceptually, it's a little easier to visualize what the numbers mean. What they're doing is they're saying, listen, let's take a look at this industry and let's look at the market shares of the firms in that industry. And that basically means what percentage of the sales go to each of these firms. So this one is not meant to indicate how competitive is a single firm like the learner index is. This one is meant for the entire industry. So how does it work? Well, let's see. What if we had an industry with two firms, and this is oligopoly, by the way, each controlling 50% of the market, this HHI index would be 50 squared plus 50 squared equals 2,500 plus 2,500 or 5,000. Okay, so you can see that we're, multi we're squaring the percentage that each one controls and that adds up to 5,000. So for a monopolist, you'd end up with a score of 10,000 because there's a single firm with 100% of the market share. And when you square 100, you get 10,000. So here you've got an upper limit of 10,000. At the bottom, um, theoretically, the HHI could go to zero for a perfectly competitive industry. It won't ever quite reach zero because each firm does have some control of that market. In other words, suppose you had, let me show you how small this thing can get. Um, what if we had a perfectly competitive industry with a thousand identical firms? Okay, so each one of them controls 0.1% of the market. So what I'm gonna do here is multiply a thousand times 0.1 squared and I end up with 10. Now 10 is not zero, but this is probably as close as we're gonna get in the real world. So yes, it's theoretically possible for HHI to be zero, but um, in practice, anything that's really close to zero would be considered perfect competition. Well, you can see why it might never actually reach actual zero. It'll get close, but it'll never quite reach zero. So the lower end, small numbers represent perfect competition. And at the upper end, the limit of this index is 10,000, which represents monopoly. Now for this one, uh, I think there are ranges that we could use. I, I think the Justice Department actually publishes the ranges that they're looking for when they decide if a merger should be approved or not. So let, let's see if we can find that on the internet. Okay, here we go. This is coming from Investopedia. So it says here, and you can see even then they're a little bit vague. They're just saying that um, HHI less than 1500 means that the market is highly competitive. 
if it's between 1500 and 2500 market is moderately concentrated. Okay, whatever that means. Um, that's probably, I would imagine you would think of that as a, a monopolistic competition. And then it says anything about 2,500, that means the market is highly concentrated. Okay, so I would go, now remember we saw before, a, an oligopoly with exactly two firms would be at 5,000. And of course a monopoly is at 10,000. So they're saying that the cutoff point after which it becomes concentrated, which means not that much competition is about 2,500. So, but these are just rough rules of thumb. There's no hard or fast rules here. This is based on experience. And so the Justice Department does look at these numbers when it tries to decide if a merger should be approved. And in fact, I'm seeing it right here. According to the Justice Department, okay, here's what they're saying. A rule of thumb is that mergers that increase the HHI by more than 200 points um, all right well will raise antitrust concerns well I'm not quite sure what that means I mean I guess what that means is they'll take a closer look at it because it's not the only thing obviously they can't just sit there and say well We'll let this go if the HHI index is above a certain level or below. It's just one piece of information that they're looking at when they try to decide whether to approve or disapprove. It would just be one of many factors that they would consider. They would never make the decision just based on the HHI, but at least we have a clue now as to how they're looking at this. Um, they're looking at the increase from the current market uh, situation to what would happen after the merger. And what they're apparently focused on is how much of an increase is there? And that's what's going to give them a tip as to whether or not uh, they should think about rejecting this or not. So that's how they apparently are using this index. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of very theoretical research that has more details about this, but for our purposes, this is good enough to understand that what the government is trying to do is avoid concentrations in an industry or excessive concentrations that could lead to higher prices for consumers and less choice. And of course, they don't want to see monopolies at all, but they're also concerned about cases where it may not be a monopoly, but highly concentrated. And in fact, very recently, um, after a lot of years of wrangling over it, recently the Justice Department approved a merger between uh, Sprint and T-Mobile. And th these companies have been fighting this for years in the courts. Um, they, the government just didn't seem to want to allow, allow it to go forward. And so it took a lot of time, you can see, I mean, 10 years in court, that's a lot of time and effort to be spending on this merger. And so they're just, I guess they're aware that um, the fewer cell phone companies there are, the less competition there will be. And the more likely that consumers will end up paying higher prices and have fewer choices. So eventually it went through, but it was a very long fight. In fact, um, I wonder if there's any details on the internet about this, oh, here we go. So in, in anticipation of a merger between Sprint and T-Mobile, um, Craig Moff, he must've been an independent consultant, calculated that the wireless industry has an HHI of 2766. <clears throat> Uh, 
um, 2766 to 3252 as a result of this merger. An increase of, let's see, let's get out the old calculator here and see how much that would have increased the total. 3252 minus 2766 is 486 points. Well, remember before they said they'll be skeptical about any merger that increases this number by 200 points. Here they're looking at potentially 500 points. And also, according to these ranges, we're already in the highly concentrated territory as it is. And so I guess the thinking was that this could make things even worse if they let it go through. But eventually the merger was approved and it was only within the last... Ooh, um, the last few months, I think. So if you were led to go ahead and read up uh, on, on, the, on this case, um, they would at some point always have to mention this HHI index because this is what they're basing their decision on. But somehow they managed to pull it off. Um, Yeah, oh, okay, it was last year. Okay, um, <clears throat> there it is, the judge approved it. And it's a big merger, $26.5 billion. Oh, so they'd previously been the third and the fourth largest wireless carriers. Now they're creating a much larger rival to AT&T and Verizon. Wow. But I mean, I think that what's happening here is that because of the technology, that is required in this business. I'm sure that the technology is horribly expensive to develop. And the thinking must be that it's getting to the point where only really gigantic companies can really um, handle this, these expenses that are required to um, develop all this advanced technology. And that it might actually be a good thing if these firms are allowed to join together because you know, let's face it, all of this, even though there's less domestic competition, we're still facing competition from a lot of foreign countries, which has to be taken into account. And in fact, even if we had a domestic monopoly, we'd still, they'd still be competing with companies, especially in China. So um, I'm sure all of those were factors in the decision to allow this to happen. It says here, the judge noted in his decision T-Mobile has redefined itself over the past decade as a maverick that has spurred the two largest players in its industry to make numerous pro-consumer changes. The proposed merger would allow the merged company to continue T-Mobile's an undeniably successful business strategy for the foreseeable future. So he's basically saying that they have done a lot to stimulate competition. Um, another, the chairman of the FCC says he, the T-Mobile Sprint merger will help close the digital divide and help secure US leadership in 5G. I, I'm sure he means compared to China. Now, I personally don't know anything about this stuff. I don't even know what 5G is, but I guess it's good. Um, <laughs> does anyone out there know what it is? I have no idea. It sounds like it must be a good thing then, because that seems to be the thrust of it is that without this merger, it would be very much more difficult for us to be competitive in uh, this 5G area. Better cell phone. Okay, that's all I need to know. That's don't don't tell me anything else. I won't understand it. But anyway, um, so this is a, an actual real world case where a merger was held off for many years because of concerns that the resulting company would be um, or reduce competition significantly in this market. And they did in fact use the HHI index to help come to a conclusion about this. But eventually, um, I guess they decided that in spite of the large increase in the HHI index, that there were enough benefits to justify the merger. Now, if they tried to merge now, turn around and merge with at and I'm sure that would be blocked. Um, that would really create a, uh, a lot less competition. But now as one big company, they can compete head to head, as they said in the article with both Verizon and AT&T. So slowly, as you can see, this industry is getting closer to what we will eventually see is called oligopoly. And um, that often happens when 
the industry itself requires enormous investments in technology or capital. And it gets to the point where competing successfully, especially with foreign companies, may simply require our you know domestic firms to be as large as possible. So we'll see how that goes in the future. But anyway, um, in the meantime, we're gonna introduce the so-called antitrust laws, which are the ones that are ultimately designed to prevent the formation of monopoly. Now, it's not just monopoly. It says they're designed to prevent an excessive concentration of economic power. It, it means that they're specifically meant to prevent monopolies from forming. And I think I mentioned last time that the word trust actually is another word for monopoly. So you can see in the name itself, it tells us these laws were designed to break up trusts or monopolies. And they were introduced around the same time that Standard Oil was at its peak of its power in the early, late 1900s, early 20th, uh, early, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, three of them were passed in a fairly short period of time. The Sherman Act of 1890, the Clayton Act of 1914, and the Federal Trade Commission Act of 1914. These were all put into place roughly at the same time. Um, and then, oh, you know what I'd like to do? Let me just go back and double check the exact date on which Standard Oil was broken up. No, oh, 1911, okay, I figured it was broken up as a result of the lawsuit brought against it by the US government in 1906 under the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. So it took five years of fighting in court for this to happen, man. That's that's a slow moving uh, lawsuit, but oh, now look at this. They've got a chart here, although it's kind of small. Basically, what it does is it shows you. Oh man, if only we could get this a little bigger. Okay, there it is. Can you see that at all? Standard Oil over here on the left was broken up into all these different components of it, and. Um, 34 companies were created. This is only a small piece of them, but you can see the parentage of companies that we know today, Chevron, ExxonMobil, BP, British Petroleum, and this Marathon, which I don't know them. And where did they come from? Well, you can see ExxonMobil ultimately is the child, I guess you could say, of Standard Oil of New York and Standard Oil of New Jersey. Mobile was originally Standard Oil of New York. Uh, Exxon was originally Standard Oil of New Jersey, and then they were combined to create Exxon Mobil. Um, BP was originally Standard Oil of Indiana and Standard Oil of Ohio, which became Amoco and Sohio, and eventually now we know them as British Petroleum. This one, I'm not that familiar with at Marathon. I guess they don't have that in this part of the country. But you can see this is what happened uh, from the original Standard Oil. And so this is, and the same kind of thing happened with when AT&T was broken up into little pieces. Um, man, maybe we could find that too while we're talking about this stuff. Maybe they have, uh, okay. Ooh, oh no, this is different. The most valuable companies over the last hundred years. Well, I think, yeah, I think we get the point there. But um, no, I was hoping to find um, if they had a similar chart for AT&T because they also had a very similar history Uh, okay, well, this is, oh, all right, well, that's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a chart, um, but anyway, a lot of the companies, like, for example, Verizon, started out as a combination of Bell Atlantic and 9X. Um, AT&T, what we now call AT&T, was originally a combination of Ameritech, Pacific Telesis, and Southwestern Bell. All of these companies were uh, created 
from the original AT&T company, and, um, which was broken up in the early 70s. So then, of course, this is what often happens. The small pieces of that gigantic company often end up recombining themselves into, instead of one gigantic company, into a small number of fairly large companies. And so it's not that unusual when a large company is broken up for this kind of thing to happen. Because what happens is these companies are now kind of small and they're trying to compete in a market that, like I said, requires an enormous investment in the technology and in, in equipment and that type of thing. And it may just be too much for a single firm. So they join up with each other. And before you know it, instead of having one gigantic company or a very large number of small companies, we end up somewhere in the middle with a few fairly large companies. So that's not that unusual. All right. Um, okay, well, anyway, so, but this is pretty cool, isn't it? I like that. It's called the Visual Capitalist. I'd never heard of this place before, but it looks pretty cool. But this, this graph, why wow, that turned out to be really, in fact, you know what I'm gonna do? Just because I think it might be helpful. There it is. In fact, you know what I think I should even do? I'll put this link into the chat room. So if you want to um, go rec uh, go look for this, and then maybe you could um, you could go to this link and then bookmark it or something. If you're interested, you know you don't have to, but I think this is a very important. All right. Well, there that was a very that was uh, something I wasn't expecting. It just makes it easier to visualize what actually happened. But anyway, um, the Sherman Act was designed to prevent any act that restrains trade, such as price fixing arrangements and cartels, which um, basically represent groups of companies that get together to try to fix prices among themselves, which is illegal in the United States. It would be like, imagine if all the oil companies got together and said, hey, you know what, let's all charge $4 a gallon for gas and not compete with each other. That would be a cartel. And then that would be illegal, according to the Sherman Act. So in other words, anything that really is um, designed to restrain trade or, you know, prevent competition, uh, fix prices, all of those would fall under this category, the Sherman Act. Um, yes, price fixing when occurs when firms collectively agree to keep their prices at higher prices than otherwise would exist with competition. And uh, no, they're not allowed to do this. Now, here we have a cartel. It's a small number of firms that more or less controls the entire market. But the point of it is that the control is maintained through price fixing placing limits on supply or quotas. In other words, they get together and they all agree what percentage of the market they can each sell. So in other words, imagine, let's say, um, let's say Coke and Pepsi got together and said, listen, Coke, you can have half the market and Pepsi, you can have half the market. And then we'll agree that we charge the same prices for all of our sodas. That would be a cartel. Okay, and of course that would be illegal. Cartels have a tendency to be unstable because they have an incentive to cheat on each other, which is what they do. They always end up dissolving because they can't trust each other. And OPEC, if you've heard of it, uh, it's a collection of oil producing countries that um, has a lot less power than they used to, but they still collectively control a fairly large percentage of the oil market. And so when they decide to uh, raise their prices or lower their prices, it can have a significant impact on all the oil importing countries. Now, since this is an international organization, there's nothing the government in the US can do about it because you know they don't have any control over foreign country, uh, companies or countries. But um, if this was happening within the US, it would be illegal. All right, now, the Clayton Act, this is sort of a follow-up to the Sherman Act 
it it's, it has more specific provisions about price discrimination and mergers. So a lot of the ones that followed up on this were basically ways of filling in the gaps that the earlier legislation did not cover. And then the Federal Trade Commission Act it has a lot of components to it. Um, it's set up to enforce antitrust laws, including the case in 1974, when AT&T was split up into 22 local telephone companies. And um, that probably was the biggest breakup since Standard Oil. It was a big one. Previously, AT&T had been granted a government monopoly on long distance telephone service, which now in this day and age, it's kind of an anachronism. Um, when you pick up the phone and make a phone call, I don't think they charge you more money to, to call uh, long distance anymore. But it used to be that you paid more money to call, let's say, California than to call uh, somebody else and purchase. And so if you made the, a long distance phone call outside of your um, area code, it was going to be provided to you. The service was provided by AT&T. They were the only ones who were allowed to deliver long distance service. But in the 70s, it became clear that with the technology changing so fast that it no longer made sense for AT&T to have this kind of uh, monopoly power. So the government broke it up into these regional bells that were called, or baby bells, they were often called. And then again, as we saw in that chart, a lot of them merged together again after the breakup into the companies that we know now, like Verizon and uh, AT&T itself, which is part of the original much larger company. Now in the late 90s, now when the, as now you can see as the technology accelerates, these laws start to have to adapt themselves to changing circumstances. Um, in the early days of Windows, um, Microsoft tried to muscle in and prevent other companies from offering um, internet browsers. And so the, let's just say that their behavior was a little, uh, Ooh, contrary to the spirit of the antitrust laws. And so they were charged multiple times with violating the antitrust laws. They were trying to make sure that only they could have a, an internet browser. And they that's to say that they took a lot of actions to push their competitors out of business. And, and in many cases, the courts ruled against them. Netscape, which you've never heard of, which doesn't exist anymore, was a competing browser to, um, uh, I could, what is theirs called again? Internet Explorer, I think. And so their 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 practices were very um, very much in violation of these antitrust laws. And so the courts ruled against them many many times during this period. And they're constantly even now they're constantly being sued for something or other. That's part of the business. Um, anytime there's um, copyrights involved or patents or trademarks there's always going to be fighting among these different companies over who owns what rights. But this was different. This was a very flagrant attempt by Microsoft to push their competitors out of business. Uh, what else? Oh, all right. Well, that was it. That was our history lesson for uh, antitrust laws. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting area of economics. Um, there's actually within the field of economics, there's many different specializations. One of them is an area called law and economics. And this is the kind of thing that they specialize in. It's the economic analysis of, uh, of, of laws, basically, including antitrust laws, among others. All right, well, anyway, so now I think we are ready to go back and wrap up our chapter 16, here it is, <laughs> problem set, which we were not quite ready to answer these last few questions last week but now we're good to go. All right, so remember, based on the way the learner index is defined, the value of the learner index for a perfectly competitive industry or firm is zero. For monopoly, it's equal to one. Okay, so now we know that because we just got through analyzing it. So because of the way this thing is defined, it has a value of zero for a perfectly competitive firm, and it has a value of one for a monopoly. Now for the HHI index, for four identically sized firms, it would be calculated as 25 squared 
plus 25 squared plus 25 squared plus 25 squared. And that's going to add up to, um, let's see, 625 plus 625 plus 625 plus 625 equals 2,500. What is the value of the HHI index for monopoly? Well, that would be 10,000. Okay, and we saw that that's because it's just the square of 100. Okay, now natural monopoly is defined in the chapter as um, this is a firm that dominates an industry because of its cost advantages. In other words, it um, experiences uh, economies of scale that make it impossible for other firms to compete with it. In other words, it's a, they have the ability to produce this product at such a low price that nobody else can realistically compete with them. Very good. All right. Oh, let me do a little tidying up here. So yeah, the rest of this we've already taken care of. So, all right. So that's it for chapter 16. Our discussion about monopoly. And I think we're done with that. So now it's time to look at monopolistic competition. Okay. So what is that all about? Well, as the name suggests, it's sort of a halfway point between perfectly uh, a perfect competition and um, monopoly. Although it, uh, it, when in an industry like that, it's not really halfway in between as such. It's think of it as being much closer to perfect competition than monopoly. I think when you when you see the examples that we give, you'll see that it isn't exactly half and half. It's more like a situation where it's a very competitive market where each individual firm though can charge a different price because their product is slightly different. Okay, so let me just quickly save this for a second. All right, so let me get that open. And then we'll carry on from there. Uh, let's see, where are we? So this is now going to be chapter 17. Uh, here we go. Monopolistic competition, yes. So what is unusual about monopolistic competition? It def definitely has features of both. So what exactly is going on in this industry? Well, first of all, we have a large number of firms typically, well, not always, but it's usually a fairly large number. Um, each pr firm produces a, a differentiated product. In other words, unlike perfect competition, they're not all selling the exact same product. So I, I think that a good example of this would be the fast food industry. <clears throat> when you think about it, even though McDonald's is, you know, like gigantic within that industry, when you stop and think about it, there's a lot, and I mean a lot of fast food chains that you could potentially go to. Not all of them serve burgers, of course, but I mean, within the fast food industry, there's an awful lot of competition. And so the firms themselves aren't necessarily tiny, like in, perfect competition, but they're not necessarily huge, like you might get in, in, let's say, an oligopoly where you would find like two steel companies. So there can be, a, a, there'll be a, typically a large number of firms, each of which could be fairly large, but they can also be fairly small. 
And of course, their products are not identical. I mean, yes, let's say McDonald's and Burger King both sell similar products, but they're not literally identical to each other. You can tell the difference between a, a burger made at McDonald's and at Burger King. In fact, Burger King goes out of their way to promote the idea that they use the flame broiling method on their hamburgers, which McDonald's does not do. And they also offer different products. For example, McDonald's has the Big Mac and uh, Burger King has the Whopper. And of course, they're not identical to each other. They're similar, but they're not identical. So that means that the firms can actually compete on price. They can all charge a different price if they choose to do so. They can also try different qualities of their product. Um, they can appeal to the high end of the market. They can appeal to the low end of the market. Like if you've ever been to this place, White Castle, they're the ones who tend to head towards the bottom of the market in terms of quality. Um, but then there's other places that might be aiming for the higher end of the market and you can have everything in between. And then can, there can be other features too, like McDonald's, for example, example has the Happy Meal and the others have their own thing going on that makes you think that they're different than their competitors. And here's a big um, deal too. It pays for them to advertise. Okay, you don't see advertising in other types of market structures. There's certainly nobody in a perfectly competitive firm would advertise because it would be a waste of their money. A monopolist doesn't need to advertise because they're the only game in town. So here is where you see advertising. And so anytime you see a lot of ads from an industry, that's pretty much a hint that that industry is monopolistically competitive. And in fact, you probably have noticed at this point in time that there are tons and tons of ads on TV from insurance companies. Um, I mean, really, when you think about it, you're always seeing ads from Geico is on all the time and Liberty and Progressive and the General and all the rest of them. They're, it, it's just round the clock almost advertising. That is a signal to us that this is a highly competitive market, but yet each firm has something that's unique to them that you can't really get with the others. So. This is one of the reasons why you see so many ads on TV from them. And the same thing is true with the fast food industry up to a point, although it used to be they would spend a lot more money in advertising. I've noticed that in recent years, you don't see quite so many ads anymore for McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and all the rest of them. I'm not quite sure why, but they seem to have gotten to a point where they only advertise here and there. But certainly right now, I would say that the biggest the area where you're getting most of your ads on TV is coming from insurance companies. I don't know, it just seems that way to me. I haven't done a scientific study in that. Maybe it's just because that's what I'm paying attention to. But um, of course, I mean, just nonstop advertising from insurance companies. And also unlike Monopoly and like perfect competition, it's not difficult to get into or out of this industry. It may be very expensive, but I, nobody is going to be able to stop you from starting up your own chain of, let's say, pizzerias or, or you know, chicken places or, um, you know, uh, burger joints. And it's, there's no um, patent, let's say, that would stop you from doing this. It, there, it may be costly, but it's, there's nothing in principle to stop you from starting up a competing chain. Um, and they do come along every so often, like, um, let's say, Chipotle, which specializes in more Mexican type food or um, what else is, what am I missing? What am I forgetting? Um, you've got places that specialize in Chinese food, for example, and places that specialize in Japanese food. And you've got places that specialize in um, Italian food, like Sabaros, for example. And they, they all have something unusual that, you know, but there's nothing to stop you from doing the same thing. Anyway, so large number of firms, typically there's a fairly large number of firms in these industries, like I was mentioning with the insurance companies, there's at least six or seven of them that advertise all the time. There's, we know there are tons of fast food companies. So because of this, each one has a relatively small market share, not like perfect competition where they each can have a tiny share of the market. 
it's small. In other words, McDonald's, even McDonald's, well, let's find out if we can get a list here somewhere. I bet this type of stuff exists. All right, here we go. Oh, this is great. Um, McDonald's is at 21.4%. Starbucks, oh, I forgot about them, 7.52%. Um, KFC is at 2.82%. Um, Subway is 2.8%. Domino's 157 Pizza Hut 124 Man, look at those numbers. We can, you get the idea. And in fact, this is a pie chart that's showing it to us. That's a fairly significant number of firms and except for McDonald's, which is up in the 20% range, these others are all under 10%. Okay, so that's what this means. In other words, each firm is fairly, has a fairly small share, but, and there's quite a few of them. Now here, they've kind of lumped together a bunch of others over here. Uh, there's, there's more, we know there's plenty more, but it gives you a good sense of, Oh, look at this. Here's another one. Oh, now this is worldwide. Oh, this is good. Worldwide. Although they're not percentages, unfortunately. But you do get the sense. McDonald's, they're, they're sitting on top. They're the kings of this business. Starbucks is a is close second. KFC, Subway, Domino's, Pizza Hut, Chipotle, Burger King, Taco Bell, and Tim Hortons. Which, until fairly recently, was only in Canada. All right, so this is what we would define as monopolistic competition. All right, you can see just this alone should tell us there's a fairly large number of firms, each of which is not dominating the industry. Nobody's in the 50s, for example. So we could certainly make the case that this is a monopolistically competitive industry and um, nobody dominates the market. Collusion. Now, remember before we talked about collusion with um, cartels, collusion means that firms get together and say, listen, why don't we all agree to charge X dollars for our product? And nobody competes with anybody else. Well, in a case like this, even if they wanted to, can you imagine what it would take to get an agreement together between all of these companies and all of them would obey this uh, agreement? It's not likely to happen. There's too many people, too many companies to get together and try to agree to something like this. So collusion would be next to impossible, even if they wanted to. All right, anyway, small market share, they all have a relatively small market share, but they can charge whatever price they want. McDonald's, there's nothing to stop them from charging whatever they want for their, uh, their burgers, but they don't want to overdo it, you know, like they can raise their price above Burger King's, but not too much because then people might switch over to not just Burger King's, but any of these other fast food places. So they have some control over their price, but not a ton of control. You know, there's, there's a severe limit to how much they can raise their prices, especially because let's face it, a lot of these fast food places often find themselves in the same mall. And so if you're in a mall, Anybody can walk around and find the prices of all the com competition before they decide what to eat. And so you better not have very high prices, otherwise you will disappear very quickly. Okay, or even if it's not a mall, let's say it's a small shopping center. All right, no firm dominates. Um, so, you know, domination means that if you choose to cut your price, the competition really has no choice but to also cut their price. So that can't happen here. You're, if McDonald's rate lowers their prices, the others may not bother to follow. They may say, no, that's all right. Uh, we'll keep our prices where they are. So that just means that if one, if, if one firm dominates, whatever prices they are charging, the others more or less have to follow along. But here that isn't the case. And then collusion, um, which is illegal to start with, Remember, we said that with uh, cartels, the biggest problem is cheating. Well, how much cheating do you think would go on if these fast food places got together and agreed to set minimum prices? It wouldn't last very long at all. In, in fact, it would be gone very quickly. 
Okay. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if you ever watched that show Deadliest Catch where they're, uh, they're fishing for a crab in the Bering Sea. In the new season, a bunch of the captains decided to, that they're going to um, sort of work together and help each other find the crabs. And of course, the minute they find crab, they cheat on each other. They don't tell each other where they found it. So, I mean, just it just disappears very quickly. Differentiated products. Now, of course, that means the products are not, you can tell as a consumer, which is which. In a perfectly competitive market, let's say the market for oranges. Um, if you go to the store and buy oranges, can you tell which farmer produced those oranges? Of course not. But even if you were, um, if, let's say that you'd, somebody decided to test your ability to tell fast food apart. And they put in front of you a burger from McDonald's and another one from Burger King without labeling them. You should have no trouble telling them apart. Okay. Um, they're just not the same. All right. They're cooked differently. They may have different ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. So that means it's important for these companies to establish what we call brand loyalty. Um, and that's what the purpose of the advertising is to say, listen, everyone, don't go over to that crummy McDonald's, um, Burger Kings when you can stay with us at McDonald's. Look at all the great things we have. And so um, they're trying to establish brand loyalty with all this advertising. You don't get brands with perfect competition. There's no point in having brands. Here, though, brands are very, very important to reinforce to you, the customer, the idea that this brand is better than that brand. And so the advertising is designed to reinforce your brand loyalty or if you've never uh, bought anything from them before to entice you to start shopping with them um, if you've never done that before. And of course, the, you know, part of the goal of competition is not, I mean, advertising is not just to say to people, listen, um, we have good products here, but also to convince them that your products are better than your competitors. Although if you notice, they never directly refer to their competition in these ads. That, used to be that they would come out and they would directly attack each other in their ads, but now it's completely different. Um, when you see all these advertisements on TV, um, it, it's like if you see an ad from Geico, they would never even acknowledge that there are other insurance companies. You know, they're just, here we are, come and, come and enjoy our products. So they, they really try very hard to avoid even mentioning each other they're just trying to convince you, listen, come to our, to us because we have the best products. Now, and again, this also means that they can compete in other ways besides prices. In other words, they may, even if they all have the same price, there are other ways they can compete. One of them is advertising, of course, but what they can also do is adjust the quality. Like I was saying before, um, you know, you might decide that you'll try to offer a, a somewhat higher quality product than your competitors, or you could go to the other extreme and offer something that's just cheap. And that, and that could appeal to different segments of the market. You know, you might aim for the low end of the market or the high end of the market or anything in between. And special features that only you have, like I mentioned before, McDonald's Happy Meals. You can't get those at Burger Kings, all right? Um, or Wendy's or whatever the case may be. So there are ways you can convince people that your product is the best. And it's not just prices, it's all about quality and features. And uh, so there's a lot of ways they can compete with each other. Now, like a monopoly, and unlike a perfectly competitive firm, because the products are not the same, we need to charge a lower price in order to sell more units of our product. In other words, the monopolistically competitive firm is facing a downward sloping demand curve. All right, so in that sense, this is something that monopolistic competition has in uh, common with monopolies. This is where it differs from perfect competition. But having said that, while the demand curve is typically, let me just throw this in here. Um, so um, even though the monopolistically competitive firm
faces a downward sloping demand curve. It's this curve will be flatter, more elastic than the demand curve faced by a monopolist. So in other words, it's, a it's flatter because the, the price elasticity of demand is higher for a monopolistically competitive firm because of the existence of so many substitutes for their products. Whereas with a monopolist, as we know, there are no other substitutes. So the demand curve is relatively steep. The demand for that product is inelastic compared to what we're seeing here. Okay, so that is one important distinction. It's not the same demand curve. It's downward sloping, but it'll typically be a little bit flatter because of the existence of so much competition for the monopolistically competitive firms the demand for their product will be uh, more elastic. And again, that's why I said before with McDonald's, um, they could theoretically raise their prices, but there's a limit to how far they can go because if people get fed up, they'll go to another one of their competitors. Whereas with Standard Oil, if they raise the price, there's nothing anybody could have done about it. They, they had to have oil. All right, quality. Um, a monopolist, monopolistically competitive firm or industry is highly competitive, but some firms may choose to emphasize quality over price. Good example, Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks. Both of them are head-to-head -head competing in the coffee market. Now, this is a matter of opinion, of course, but the Dunkin' Donuts coffee is definitely more inexpensive than the Starbucks coffee. Now, some people prefer Dunkin' Donuts and some people prefer Starbucks, but I think it's pretty clear that Starbucks is aiming for the higher end of that market and Dunkin' Donuts is aiming for the lower end, meaning that people who go to Dunkin' Donuts would be very much off put if the price went up, even by a quarter. Whereas in Starbucks, they're getting they're there to, you know, buy a higher type, let's say higher quality coffee, and maybe a quarter price difference won't matter so much to them. Yes, I would agree. Starbucks is a superior coffee. Um, it's just richer and more has more flavor to it. But that doesn't mean Dunkin' Donuts coffee is bad. It certainly is not. But I would say that Dunkin' Donuts is aiming for, they probably get their coffee from, let's say, Brazil or Colombia. And that's good coffee, but Starbucks is getting it from all these exotic locations like Kenya and, um, you know, Sumatra and, you know, at all these different remote regions of the world, um, they're getting this very amazingly strong flavored coffee. But of course, you have to pay more money to buy it because it's more expensive to produce it. So yes, the two, if the, even if the two companies charge the exact same price for their coffee, there's still competition going on in the sense that Starbucks is drawing in the high-end customers and Dunkin' Donuts is going to the other extreme. They both advertise like crazy. And um, that too, yeah, I think that that is a large part of it too. They, they're constantly making it fresh in the store. And, um, but on the other hand, if you notice Dunkin' Donuts, I mean, realistically, the coffee is just there to go along with the donuts and the muffins, which I think are their big sellers. I don't know that for a fact, but I would suspect that most of their profits come from the donuts themselves and the bagels and all the rest. Whereas Starbucks, the food is sort of incidental. You know, you, you don't, you know, a lot of people don't buy food in Starbucks, but if you go to a Dunkin' Donuts, there's a very high chance that you're gonna get something to go with the coffee. So the competition, it's not, they're not exactly doing the same thing, but the coffee itself, um, they're very much aiming for different ends of the market. So, um, you can see you'd never get this with perfect competition because in a perfectly competitive environment, every one of them would have the exact same coffee. It would be indistinguishable from the others. So here we don't see that. 
Okay, so this is uh, perf uh, this is more monopolistic competition because we can tell the coffees apart. So, um, so therefore, Starbucks is grabbing people who are willing to pay more money for more expensive coffee, and Dunkin' Donuts is is the other extreme. Uh, people who come in there expect the coffee to be inexpensive. All right, features. Oh, here we go. So each monopolistically competitive firm may offer different features of its products that the others do not. For example, Arby's, if you've ever been to an Arby's, they have roast beef sandwiches, which you're not going to get at McDonald's or Burger King's. And the crispy curly fries, which are so delicious. I don't know why the others don't have them, but they don't, or at least not that I'm aware of. So Arby's is basically saying to the market, listen, we have the same prices as, as everyone else, but you know what? We have roast beef sandwiches and cr crispy curly fries and the others do not. Therefore you should come to us. And so again, this is the kind of thing you would never see in a, a perfectly competitive market. Uh, what do you actually offer the customers that's different? And in fact, this is how they make a name for themselves by promoting the products that they have that the others just don't have. So, it's a much smaller chain, of course. Um, you know, you don't see them all over the place, but when, when you do see one, you know, they do have stuff that you won't get anywhere else. So just keep that in mind if you're driving around and you need to eat someplace and you see an Arby's, just remember roast beef sandwiches and crispy curly fries. So therefore you'll go there, if that's what you want, you'll go there even if their prices are slightly higher than the uh, competition. All right, advertising, of course. Perfectly competitive firms and monopolies do not need to advertise. And in fact, with perfectly competitive firms, it would be a complete waste of their money. Um, it's like Standard Oil. Do you think if, well, of course it was a different time, but if Standard Oil was around today, do you think they would have ads on TV? No, what would be the point? If you want oil, you have to go to them. So there would be no advertising. But with for, uh, the monopolies of competition, because they're trying to establish a brand name of loyalty in you, and they're trying to you know, promote the idea that they have something better than their competitors, they spend a fortune on advertising. Okay, and uh, it must, it's, it's just mind boggling to think how much these companies must spend on advertising. And you know, the, now that I think about it, um, you used to see a lot more ads from Coke and Pepsi too. They seem to have sort of gotten away from that. Um, they used to be on all the time, and now they've kind of, the only reason I can think of is that maybe they've gotten so big that they don't need to bother anymore, that um, basically Coke and Pepsi are, are the two major companies in that soft drink market. They own a lot of other soft drinks that you may not even be aware of. Like, for example, Mountain Dew, I think, belongs to Pepsi. And uh, I think Sprite belongs to Coke. And I mean, if you could actually go get a list, in fact, why don't we do that? Um, which companies does Coke own? They own, all right, here we go. Sprite, Fanta, Schweppes, and these other, oh, Fresca, Barks, that's a root beer, I believe. If you buy one of those products, that's a Coke product, whether you realize it or not. And so the idea was that they found it to be cheaper to uh, buy out the competition rather than develop these flavors themselves. How about Pepsi? Oh, here we go. Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Lay's, Potato Chips, Gatorade, Tropicana, 7-Up. I forgot about 7-Up, yes. Doritos. See, the, the difference too here is that PepsiCo is involved in a big way with snack foods, which Coke really isn't. In fact, I've been told by people who work there that PepsiCo, most of their profits actually come from the snacks rather than the sodas. It's that lucrative. And um, anyway, so you probably are all aware that their headquarters are not far away from the school. There they are. And they also have this enormous sculpture garden, which I think even now you're allowed to visit, although I think you have to make arrangements well in advance. If you didn't know that, 
PepsiCo, if you're interested, um, if nothing better to do one day, they have this enormous sculpture garden. One of the early owners of the company was really big into sculptures. So it's open to the public, which is very unusual for a private corporation. And you can get permission to go in there. Oh, crap. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, I guess we have to wait a little longer. But one of these days, you should run over there if you can and check this out. It's pretty impressive. Oh, I'm really annoyed. You wouldn't think it would be a problem because they're, they're it's outside and they're very far apart from each other, but all right, whatever. Oh, and one more thing, of course, um, firms are free to enter and exit this industry. There's no legal reasons why you can't jump into this industry. All right. So we would expect that like with perfect competition in the long run, most monopolistically competitive firms will break even. In other words, zero economic profits, or as we say, the price would equal average total costs. All right. Now, oh, it is getting a little late here. Um, we're st we still have a ways to go here. And I noticed that um, our discussion about the Hirsch Finale Index, HHI, is back. That's cool. Um, so we've got a lot of more fun stuff to do here. But on Thursday, remember, we're going to go over the sample midterm. And if there's any time left, we'll come back and revisit our discussion here about monopolistic competition, which I think you'll agree you know, the more you think about it, the more it seems like most industries in this country probably fall into this category. You, you don't see a whole lot of perfect competition and certainly not monopolies. Most of the, them fall into this category. Anyway, so I think we'll stop it right here and I'll see you all on Thursday. All right. You're welcome. Thank you later. Bye. See you later. You're welcome. Bye.